want you to take your Bibles, if you have a copy of God's Word, turn with me please to the book of 1 Peter in your New Testament, the book of 1 Peter chapter 1. And today I want to talk to you about how to find hope. Steve Callahan was about 12 years old when he fell in love with sailing. He loved everything about being out on a boat, whether it was a little boat or a big boat, whether it was out on a lake or out on the ocean, he loved sailing. He loved everything about it. He loved the freedom. He loved seeing the beauty of nature. He, just, he loved everything about how the boat worked and doing all the things that it took to sail a boat. He loved sailing. And as he grew, he became an expert sailor. In fact, he built his own boat. It was a 21-foot boat. He called it the Napoleon Solo. And his goal was to sail that boat across the Atlantic Ocean by himself, Napoleon Solo. He was going to go all the way across the Atlantic Ocean by himself. And he had everything planned out. He was going to go and and cover the Atlantic with sort of a looping pattern that would take him all the way across. He had been out on the ocean for seven days when something happened. We're not sure what happened. It happened in the night. It may have been a storm He really thought that there was some type of whale or something that did damage to his little boat. But when he woke up the next morning, the boat was taking on water and sinking. He was by himself. He could not save the boat, but he did manage to survive himself by getting on a tiny inflatable life raft. And he was there on that life raft for 76 days, floating out in the middle of the ocean. Now, 76 days is a long time. Just to help you think about it, 76 days ago was January 23rd. Think about everything that you've done from January 23rd until today. All the places you've been, the things you've done, the things you've seen, the people you've talked to for 76 days, the same number of days, Steve Callahan was on that life raft. And it was a terrible time. He fought everything you could imagine. Sharks, circling that inflatable raft, dealing with incredible hunger and thirst, sunburn, saltwater blisters that he said were like acid slowly dropping on his skin for 76 days. On the 76th day, he was off the shore of an island in the Caribbean, and some fishermen saw birds that were circling around his raft, and they came out and they rescued him. The only thing that kept Steve Callahan alive for those days was hope. His worst days were the days when he gave up hope about being rescued, but somehow day by day he managed to hold on to some type of hope for his future and that someone would find him until finally they did. You can't live without hope. Now you can live for about 70 days without any food. You can live for 10 days without water. You can even live for six minutes without air. But I'll tell you something, you can't live one moment without hope. Because hope is what keeps us alive. Hope is what shows us that there is something better for us in the future, something worth living for. And here's the good news of God's word. Jesus' resurrection brings hope. Just those four words, Jesus' resurrection brings hope. If you don't remember anything else about my message today, I hope you'll remember those four words because they're life-changing, eternity-changing words. Jesus resurrection brings hope. And that's what the Word of God talks about in 1 Peter chapter 1. I want you to stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3 of the text. Peter writes this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has called us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 
to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have to be grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is the word of God. Will you join with me as we pray? Lord God, I pray in these moments that you would move me out of the way and God, that you would speak a word to people in this room today. Lord, I pray that you would speak a word to believers today to reignite and to strengthen our hope in you. And Lord, for those in this room who have never been saved, Lord, today, may they turn to you. May they trust Jesus Christ as Savior. May they be saved by faith in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God will give you glory and honor for all that you do. For you, Lord, are our hope. And we pray these things in Jesus' holy name. And church, if you agree with that prayer, will you say amen? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So many people lose hope. So many people try to live their lives without any hope, and they're just existing and going through the motions because there's no real hope there. And all kinds of things can cause you to experience hopelessness. Sometimes we experience hopelessness because we lose somebody that we love and care about. Sometimes we experience hopelessness because we feel abandoned and all alone and no one seems to understand us or even to know us. Sometimes we experience hopelessness because of Things we've done in the past that we regret and the guilt of our past and the sins of our past cause us to experience hopelessness. Sometimes we experience hopelessness because we have fear about our future and what's going to happen next. But the word of God says that because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we can live every day on earth and live forever Because Jesus Christ has given us hope through his resurrection. I want us to look at this passage of scripture together today. And as we do, I want to talk to you about three aspects of the hope that the resurrection of Jesus gives us. Three aspects of the hope of the resurrection. First of all, the Bible shows us because Jesus has risen, you can find the hope of a new start. Today, you can find the hope of a new start in your life because Jesus Christ has risen. Look again with me in our text in verse 3. And Peter begins with a word of praise and worship to the Lord. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's why. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The Bible says that God has shown us great mercy. Mercy is is when God holds back on giving us what we deserve. Now the Bible says we've all sinned. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God and because of our sin, we deserve punishment and judgment and eternal death and separation from God in a place called hell. But because of great mercy, God has given us a living hope. And the Bible says he's caused us, look again in verse 3, he's called us to be born again to this living hope. That's what it means to be saved. Being saved by Jesus Christ is a new birth. It's being born again. It's a new start. It's a new life that gives us a new hope. Being saved isn't a matter of just saying, "Uh uh-huh, to a set of statements about Jesus. It's not just a matter of saying, "Uh uh-huh, I believe Jesus is God's son. Uh Uh-huh, I believe he died on the cross. Uh Uh-huh, I believe he rose from the grave. It's much, much more than just saying, "Uh uh-huh, yes, I agree with those things. 
Being saved is a new birth. It's a brand new life, a brand new start. And we need that. Now, when, when the Bible uses the phrase born again here in 1 Peter, that's not the first time that that phrase appears in Scripture. The first time it appeared was on the lips of Jesus to a man named Nicodemus. I want you to take your Bibles and turn a few pages back in your, in your New Testament to John's Gospel, chapter 3. Nicodemus was a religious leader among the Jewish people. He was part of a group called the Pharisees. Most of the Pharisees hated Jesus. They wanted to do everything they could to destroy him. But Nicodemus just saw something different. And his heart was open enough to what God wanted to do in his life that he came to Jesus, and the Bible says he came to Jesus at night. Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. One of my friends calls him Nick at night. Uh, that's an 80s and 90s reference. But anyway, Je Jesus met Nicodemus at night because Nicodemus was afraid to come during the daytime. He didn't want the other Pharisees or the people in the community to, to even have any idea that he might be following Jesus. In verse 2 of John chapter 3, Nicodemus said to Jesus, Jesus, we know that you have to be a teacher sent from God. Because no one could do the signs, the miracles that you do, unless God is with him. And here's what's amazing. Jesus really didn't say anything in response to what Nicodemus had said. Instead, he said to him in verse 3, Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, just speaking to one man, Nicodemus, truly, truly, I say to you, Nicodemus, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In other words, Jesus was saying, Nicodemus, I'm not really interested in whether you put the stamp of approval on me or not. I'm here to tell you the absolute truth. Unless you are born again, you're not going to see heaven. You're not going to see God's kingdom. You're not going to enter. There has to be a radical new start in your life. You must be born again. And Nicodemus didn't quite understand it. Look in the next verse. Nicodemus said to Jesus, well, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born and Jesus, again, didn't answer his question. He just said, Nicodemus, I'm telling you, you've got to be born again. And that night, as far as we can see, Nicodemus didn't experience the new birth, but somewhere along the way, he came to faith in Jesus Christ, and he received that new birth, that new life, that new start. Because the Bible tells us that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, there were two men who were courageous enough to come publicly and identify with Jesus, to take his body down off of the cross, to bury his body in a tomb, to prepare his body for burial and to take care of him in his death. And those two men were both Pharisees. One was Joseph of Arimathea. The other was, guess who? Nicodemus. Why? Because he was born again. He had a new start. The resurrection of Jesus gives us the hope of a new start. And, and we need that new start, that new life, that born again experience that only Jesus can give us. And so many people are looking for a new start. They're looking in all the wrong places. There was a Christian young woman in her 20s. Her name was Jan. And she was at a hotel pool. And she was sitting there. And next to her were two teenage girls. She wasn't with them. She really didn't know them. But they just began to sort of include Jan in their conversation. And one of the girls' names was Brittany. And, and Brittany was talking about a meeting she was going to go to the next week of this neo-pagan group. It was a group that came from high schools and places all over the region, and they were coming together. It was a neo-pagan group where they worshiped gods and goddesses and nature and all kinds of things. And she was really excited about it. At first, Jan was going to try to speak some type of word of correction, but instead, she said, well, I don't really know these girls. So she said, I'm just going to listen. And she just listened as, as they talked. And after Brittany had shared a little bit about this neo-pagan group and where she was going, Jan just said, wow, you seem to be really excited about that. 
And that's all it took for Brittany to begin to tell how much this group meant to her. The long story short was she had experienced some really traumatic things in high school. And this group of neo-pagans had welcomed her and been nice to her and included her. And then as she was talking to Jan, Brittany said this, I've been through so much garbage in high school that I will probably be in therapy the rest of my life just to get over it. And Jan said to her, you know, you probably can't even imagine a future where you don't experience pain. And when she said that, something just touched Brittany's heart. She began to to tear up. And she said to Jan, you're right. I wish, here's what she said literally. She said, I wish I could just be born all over again. She said, I wish I could just start life over from scratch. And Jan said, would you really like to be born again? And Brittany said, I really would. And then Jan began to share with her the gospel of Jesus Christ. How Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave so that we can really be born again. A brand new start. Some of you are here today and more than anything else you need that. You're carrying around the hopelessness, the pain from your past. And you just want to start over. The good news of the gospel is you can. When Jesus Christ came out of the grave, when he rose up from the dead, he came to bring a new life and a new birth to everyone who trusts in him. So the Bible says that you can find hope, the hope of a new start because Jesus is risen from the grave. There's a second aspect of the hope that Jesus gives us because of his resurrection that we see in this text. Number two, because Jesus has risen, you can find the hope of a sure future. You can find the hope of a sure future. Now continue reading with me in verse four of the text. Peter continues on and says, we've been born again to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You know, when you're born into a family, you get a new family, you get a new father, you get a new mother, you get a new future. When you're born into the kingdom of God, you get a new father, God in heaven, you get a new family, the family of God, everyone else who has been saved, and you also get a new future. Peter talks about it as an inheritance, to an inheritance. An inheritance is something that a child receives just because he's part of the family. You don't earn an inheritance. You don't buy an inheritance. You don't work for an inheritance. You receive it because you're part of the family. And the Bible says we have a sure inheritance, a sure future in Jesus Christ. And that inheritance is eternal life. It's eternity in heaven with Jesus. And notice what the Bible says about that inheritance. It it uses four words to describe our inheritance. Look again in verse four. It's an inheritance that is imperishable. That means nothing can destroy it. It's an inheritance that is undefiled. That means nobody, including you, can do anything to mess it up. Our own sin can't mess it up because it's a gift from God. It's also an inheritance that is unfading. Think about this. Everything else we have on earth is fading away. You buy a new car and instantly it's depreciating and it's on its way to the junkyard. You get new clothes, instantly they are deteriorating. Eventually you're gonna put them in a bag somewhere and give them away or throw them away. But the inheritance that we have in Jesus is unfading. After we've been in heaven for 10,000 years, it will be just as fresh and new and beautiful as it ever has been. And forever and ever it will be unfading. So it's imperishable, undefiled, unfading. And then also the inheritance of heaven, look at what it says, is kept in heaven for you. That word kept means to be guarded over. God himself is guarding over your salvation. He's guarding over your eternal life. You 
can't lose it. In fact, he's not only guarding your inheritance, he's guarding you. Look at it again. Kept in heaven for you, and then look in verse 5, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Listen, this is so good. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. It's like God has a safe where he has put your inheritance of eternal life. And you've got that safe in your hand. Nothing can take it away from you. And then he puts you inside of a vault and nobody can get you. Nobody can get your inheritance. Nobody can take you. Nothing can ever take you away from the love that God has shown you through his son, Jesus Christ. Praise God for that. You have a sure future. One of the things that causes people to lose hope is when we don't know what's going to happen next. Uncertainty will cause you to smile less and worry more. If you don't know what's going to happen next, it just messes you up. Now, I read this is a true experiment that happened. It it seems strange to me, but it really happened. It happened in in the Netherlands. And here's how the experiment worked. They had two groups of people, and they were going to perform this psychological experiment on them. They they took the first group, and they told told them, we're going to give you a series of of 20 strong electrical shocks. They hooked them up to some type of apparatus and they said, we're gonna give you a series of 20 strong electrical shocks. These are the Dutch, the Dutch don't play around. They said, we're gonna give you 20 electrical shocks, 20 strong electrical shocks. That was the first group. The second group, they told them this, we're gonna give you 17 really mild electrical shocks and then we're gonna give you three strong electrical shocks, but we're not going to tell you when you're going to get the strong shocks. You're going to get 17 weak and three strong, but you don't know when the strong shocks are going to come. Now, let me ask you the question. Who do you think experienced more anxiety in that experiment? The first group or the second group? The second group. Why? Because they didn't know what was coming. They didn't know what was coming. And so many times in our lives, we experience a lack of hope and a lack of peace and a lack of joy just because we don't know what's coming. Mary Magdalene came to the empty tomb on that first Easter Sunday. Take your Bible and turn with me to John's Gospel, chapter 20. Mary Magdalene loved Jesus so much. He had delivered her from demonic possession, the Bible tells us. And she had just served and followed him and told other people about him. The Bible says that when Jesus was dying on the cross, one of the few people who followed him who would risk even being identified with him and stayed at the foot of the cross as Jesus died was Mary Magdalene. And then she had watched as Nicodemus and Joseph had sealed the body of Jesus in the tomb. And three days later, she came. She and some of the other women had wondered if, if they'd be able to roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb. And they came to find that the stone had been rolled away and the tomb was empty. But she was not excited about that. She was not rejoicing over that. Instead, she was frightened because she did not know. In fact, the Bible says she did not know. She looked inside that tomb And there where the body of Jesus had been, there was one angel seated at where the head would have been and another where his feet would have been. And and they, they asked her, woman, why are you weeping? Because she was weeping at the tomb as she looked in. And Mary said, I'm weeping because they've taken my Lord away and I do not know where they've taken him. She did not know. Uncertain, unsure. I do not know where they've taken him. And she had no hope. And then the Lord Jesus himself, risen, came up behind her. And the Bible says, Mary did not know that it was Jesus. She did not know. See, when you don't know, you lose hope. When you don't know what your future is going to be, you lose hope. When you don't know what's next, You lose hope. She did not know. Then the Bible says, beginning in verse 15 of the text in John 20, Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, 
She said to him, Lord, or sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. See, suddenly she had hope because suddenly she knew. Before she did not know, but now she knew she knew it was Jesus. She knew he had risen. She knew he hadn't just been taken away, his body taken away somewhere else. She knew he was alive. Jesus said to her, verse 17, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. Suddenly she had a future because Jesus is alive. Can I tell you something? Our only hope for a sure future is knowing Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Apart from him, you don't know your future. In fact, you don't, you don't know your future on earth. You may think you do, but you don't. If I were to ask you, how many of you can tell me with absolute certainty what you'll be doing and where you will be this coming Tuesday at 10 a.m.? There's not one person in this room who could say, I know exactly where I'm going to be this Tuesday at 10 a.m. Some of you say, oh, Pastor, no, I know. I've got it on my cell phone. I can tell you exactly. My calendar tells me where I'm going to be. You don't know. You may have it on your calendar. You may have it on your schedule. You may have a plan. You may have it written down somewhere. You may have an alarm set to tell you where you're going to be. You don't know where you're going to be this Tuesday at 10 a.m. A lot can happen between now and then. And then if I were to ask you, how many people in this room know for certain where you'll be and what you'll be doing on this same day, April 9th, 2026, three years from now, there's not one person who knows for sure where we'll be or what we'll be doing three years from now. But, everybody still with me, say amen if you are. But if I were to ask believers, how many of you know exactly where you'll be and what you'll be doing 10,000 years from now. How many of you know exactly where you'll be 10,000 years from now? Say, I do. All across this room. Because in him, we have a certain future. I know where I'm going to be 10,000 years from now and 10,000 years after that. I'm going to be with Jesus in his presence forever. Why? Because the Bible says... He's given me an inheritance, look at it, that can never perish, never spoil, never fade, and it's kept in heaven for me, and I'm kept. So nothing can separate me from what God has for me in Jesus Christ. We have the hope of a new start. We have the hope of a sure future. Thirdly, I want you to see this. Because Jesus has risen, you can find the hope of a deep joy. The hope of a deep joy. Joy. Continue reading with me in verse 6 of 1 Peter chapter 1. And there Peter writes this. In this you rejoice. Man, as I was studying that this week, I just came to that word this. And I began to ask myself the question. It says, in this you rejoice. And I said, well, what does this stand for? What, what does he mean when he says in this? Is he talking about God's mercy? In this I rejoice. Is he talking about being born again? In this I rejoice. Is he talking about my hope? In this I rejoice. Is he talking about the, the resurrection? In this I rejoice. Is he talking about my inheritance? And the answer is yes to all those questions. In all of those things, in everything that God has given me through his son Jesus Christ, in this you rejoice. We can have unspeakable joy right now. Listen. Salvation is not just something that we look to the future and say, okay, one day it's going to be miserable in between now and then, but one day I'll be with Jesus in heaven. That's not what the Bible says. It says you can rejoice right now because of what Jesus Christ has given you through his resurrection. In this, you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved 
by various trials. Now, the Bible's up front and saying there, there are going to be trials that grieve us, that cause us to mourn while we live on this earth. We're grieved, the Bible says, by various trials. The word various there literally means variegated or multicolored. <laughs> trials come in all sizes, shapes, and colors, and they never run out. Isn't that encouraging to you today? They never go away. But we can rejoice in the midst of those trials. Why? Because of Jesus. Notice what the Bible says there in verse 8 of our text. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Though you do not see him, you believe in him. There's a story, another story about what happened after Jesus rose from the grave. It's found near the end of John chapter 20. So you might want to turn back there with me. The Bible says that on the day that Jesus rose from the grave, he rose from the grave on the first day of the week, on a Sunday. That's why we worship on Sunday. That's why we celebrate Easter on Sunday. He rose on the first day of the week. He rose on the first day of the week. And that night after his resurrection, his disciples were in a room there in Jerusalem, and they were afraid. After all, Jesus, their leader, had just been crucified a few days earlier. And so they were still afraid, and and so they were there in that room, and the door was shut, and it was locked and bolted, when suddenly Jesus just appeared with them physically. Didn't have to open the door, didn't have to unlock the door, didn't have to knock on the door. He just appeared physically with them in the room. You say, how did Jesus do that? He's Jesus. He can do anything. So he just showed up. And he, he, he showed them his hands, and his side, his body that had been crucified so that they would know it was him. It wasn't a, a spirit. He wasn't a ghost. He wasn't a specter. It was him physically resurrected standing in front of them. And they all saw and believed and rejoiced. One disciple was missing. And his name was, you tell me, what was the disciple who was missing? What was his name? Thomas. And we all know him by his nickname, what? That's not his nickname. His nickname is not Doubting Thomas. His nickname is the twin. Didn't you know that? That was a trick question, by the way. We all call him Doubting Thomas, but every time John talks about him, he calls him the twin. He says, Thomas, who was also called the twin. So he must have looked like somebody else. They called him the twin, or he may have been a twin. He may have had a twin brother. But anyway, we call him Doubting Thomas, just as you said. And the other disciples told Thomas, well, Jesus is alive, and we've seen him. And here's what Thomas said. Look in verse 25 of John chapter 20. Thomas said, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. He wasn't just doubting. He wasn't just saying, I got my doubts. He said, I'm not believing this. You can tell me all you want to. All of you, all of Peter and James and John, you can all line up. You can tell me whatever you want to tell me. I will never believe unless I see him for myself. And the Bible says eight days later. By the way, that was another Sunday because they counted it Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Eight days later, they were in that same room, again afraid, again the door's closed, it's locked, it's bolted. Again, Jesus shows up. How did he show up? Because he's Jesus. He can do anything. And there he is. And this time Thomas is there. And notice what he says. Eight days later, verse 26 of the text. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Can can I just stop right there? He knew what Thomas needed. Thomas didn't have to come to him and say, hey, Jesus, I need you to show me something. 
He knew already what Thomas needed. He knows what you need. He knows your name. He knows your need. He knows who you are. He said, Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And then Thomas, who we call Doubting Thomas, made the greatest confession of faith in any of the Gospels. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. You can see him on his knees at the feet of Jesus looking up at the Lord through his tears and saying, my Lord and my God. I don't have to put my fingers anywhere. I don't have to put my hand anywhere. I just, you are my Lord. And my God, Jesus said to him in verse 29, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. What does Peter say? Though you have not seen him, you love him. We haven't seen him, but we love him. Amen? Though you do not now see him, You believe in him. We don't see him, but we believe in him. Amen? And rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. I remind you of my point. The resurrection of Jesus gives us the hope of deep joy. Though we have not seen him, we love him. Though we do not see him, we believe in him. And because we believe in him... We have a joy that is inexpressible. You know, there are storms on the ocean that can tear ships apart. Not just little boats like the one I told you about at the beginning of my message. I mean, big ships can be torn apart. But there are certain ships that can sail through a storm without even feeling the wind or being tossed by the waves. And those ships are submarines. They go down deep enough that the storm that is raging no longer moves them. An Ohio-class submarine can go 240 meters below the surface, and at that depth, the sailors on board don't feel the storm. The storm is there, but they are in an ocean that is deeper than that storm. You'll go through storms. I'll go through storms. There are storms that can destroy and harm us. But we as believers in Jesus Christ can plunge deep into our faith in him and say, Lord, I don't have to see you. I just believe you. And I don't have to see you, but I love you. And I'm going to dive deep into my faith in you. And as you dive deep into your faith, you discover a joy that is deeper than your storm. He gives us a deep joy when we trust in him. Her name is Jamie Ivey. She's a minister's wife and a writer in Austin, Texas. And Jamie and her husband have a little boy. And when he was really little, he had this raspy, just cute little voice. That when he talked, even when they were out shopping or somewhere... People, would, people they didn't know would hear their little boy talk with this cute, little, adorable, raspy voice. And people would just stop and, and get him to say things. His voice was just really something to hear, really noticeable. And she said, they loved to hear that little voice. She said, until one day I began to, to understand that my little boy's adorable, raspy little voice was interfering with his life. And she said she was driving and her boy was talking from the back seat car and she couldn't understand him his voice had gotten so raspy and so weak that she was having to read his lips just to understand what he was saying and so she went to the pediatrician and the pediatrician said well you know I don't think it's anything to be concerned about but let's have him go to an ENT an ear nose and throat doctor and just see what's happening and so the day of his appointment they had a big breakfast as a family and great day and her husband went to the church to work and and she took along the, the little boy with the, the voice and, and the, the, their two-year-old son, and, and they went together to the, to the ENT. The doctor came in. She said, 
even before he put on his examination gloves, just hearing their little boy talk, she said he, he could tell something was wrong. And she said in just a few moments, he was giving a diagnosis and using words like disease and cancer and surgery and incurable. She said that day had started off great. We thought that this appointment was just no big deal. All of a sudden, everything was turned upside down. Within a week, their little boy had surgery, serious surgery for a cancer that has no cure. The good news is, praise the Lord, he came through the surgery. He came through it well, and and he's alive and and doing great, and, and praise God for that. But Jamie looked back on that day. And she said, the moment we got that news, it seemed like all the hope just vanished. And everything was turned upside down. Think about Peter when Jesus died. Or Nicodemus taking that body down off the cross. Or Mary standing outside the empty tomb and not knowing where he was. Or Thomas Wondering, why can't I see what everybody else has seen? Those days turned their world upside down. But everything was made right because of the hope of the resurrection. I want you to hear what Jamie Ivey wrote. She said, though our lives are full of sorrow and pain, sickness and unwanted diagnosis, Death and betrayal. Jesus brings hope in the midst of the messiness of life. Man, that's good news today. When your life is at its messiest, you can turn to Jesus and in him find real hope. 